Welcome to Breaking Par with Bernard Sheridan, the golf podcast that interviews the best and brightest minds in the golf industry. Now, here's your host, Bernard Sheridan. Dave, welcome to Breaking Par. Thanks so much for taking the time out of your day today to be with us. Bernard, it's just great to be here. Looking forward to it. So what we always like to start our interviews with here is the very first time that you picked up a golf club. When was that? Well, if, uh, if memory serves me correct, I was uh, about three and a half. Um, my mother was a really good um, amateur player. And um, I have a picture of me kind of riding on her golf bag uh, on a pull cart, kind of like a marsupial. And uh, so I know that, uh, that the pro had uh, cut, cut down a club for me uh, and uh, really just to keep me busy so my mom could work on her game. And, uh, and that was the start of it back in Hutchinson, Kansas. So where did it lead to from there, uh, and what made you decide um, that maybe this would be a, a good career path for you? Well, yeah, early on, um, I had the opportunity and, and with uh, the pro who was working with my mother, um, also worked with uh, Jim Hardy, and uh, 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 Jim is from my, my hometown. And um, I can remember as a really youngster um, uh, standing out on the, the driving range and shagging golf balls for uh, Jim while he hit. Uh, and uh, and I, th I remember thinking to myself around the age of 10 or 12 when people were saying, what do you think you're going to do, you know, for your uh, with your life? And and I thought golf would probably be a great way to never have to work a day in your life. Yeah. So that, that was kind of the, <laughs> that was what the deciding point was. And it, and it is too. It's uh you know, I mean, I know that I feel like when I go out to the lesson C to, to do lessons uh, down there at Tiburon that um, I'm not going to work. I'm, I'm going to have a good time and, and, uh, and help, and help people play better. And it's, it just really is true. It, it really feels like you never work a day in your life. Yeah, I just hope nobody ever really gets wind of the fact that, that we've uh, been able to escape, you know, the real grind of a job. I think they know that, but I think that um, they're not going to take it away from us. So uh, <laughs> because we, we must be doing something right along the way. That's right. So so where are you located at this moment? Well, I am in um, what is uh, perennially about, uh, in, in most of the travel magazines, um, they talk about this being one of the most beautiful places on the planet. I'm in Sedona, Arizona, at a uh, fantastic club, uh, Seven Canyons, um, a Weisskopf designed um, gem of a golf course, but uh, in this, the setting it's in, it makes it just spectacular. So you've been in the game for quite a while now. Um, and and have been and have been doing instruction for quite a while now. So, what is your take on what has happened in instruction over the past, let's say, twenty years? Well, I, I think what uh, um, whether you whether you look at it good or, or bad, um, you know, I, I I started teaching probably forty years ago, um, and you had to rely on your eye. And your and kind of your ear, um, you know, you really didn't have all of the ways to capture um, uh, motion data and, and uh, uh, you know with the launch monitors and everything. Now there's uh, you can uh, uh, you can take uh, the uh, the motion and and uh, the results and look at them incrementally in millions of bits of data. And I think that. That over the last 20 years, what has really changed has been um, the uh, applications of that data, uh, the way we're able to um, uh, parse out that that, that is uh, uh, not really relevant and uh, be able to focus on those things that are relevant. Um, I think sometimes these days, though, it, it, it gets a little bit carried away. Uh, when you kind of get away from, so what is the ball doing, and then, and then, what are you doing to create those shots, uh, and uh, and and keeping it a little more simple, 
Uh, but I think that's the biggest thing over the last 20 years has just been the explosion of um, uh, technology uh, with the game, being able to, uh, to capture all of this data. Do you find that um, having that technology or, or using that technology yourself, that it, it really helps you cut through the, to the quick, quickly, um, as opposed to how it was before you had this available to you? Well, yeah, I, I was one of the you know very early adapters with uh, when when video um, came along, uh, you know, putting that into our golf schools. Uh, if you remember way back when Sony came out with the Sony Caddy Cam, um, I I had uh, uh, used those within our in our golf school, and uh, what it was able what we were able to do, and the way I looked at it was, I was finally able to share with a student what it was I was seeing so that when I started to make changes and then we could compare the changes to what we started with, um, they had a visual reference point for something that was a physical motion. And, uh, and I found that to be invaluable. Yeah, I, I know that I find too that when, when a student can see what they're doing and then translate that into, because I know that when – when I say, okay, you're really here, and and they can't see it, right? Th th then then you go, okay, I want you to, let's say, it's, it's like, let's say they're over swinging. And I say to them, uh, you know, I want you to go halfway back, and I'll show them where I want them to be. Yeah. And then they'll swing, and they'll, be, they'll definitely be past that, um, mm -hmm. but they'll feel like it was at that point, um, and now they're kind of halfway between where they were before, and where I and where I asked them to be, and they're really right. kind of where I want them to be. Um, and and then they, but then then when they go to look at it, they still feel like they've gone a lot further than what they thought. Yeah, yeah, and I think that, that I I always just uh, kind of describe that as the difference between feel and real. Um, what someone thinks they're doing uh, and what they indeed are doing can be two completely different things. And, you know, and getting somebody who gets off playing, gets it, you know, it, what we used to describe as across the line at the top of the swing, you know, if you can't show them that, it is really hard for them to, to process what, what the difference between being in that position and the position you want them to be in, uh, what, that, uh, what that difference looks like and then translates to feels like. So when before video came along, because you, you've been doing this for quite a while, as you said, 40 years. Um, so before the video came along, what were the things that you would do to help them understand that? Well, I, I you know, going back even before we could, it, it became easier to use video on the T. Um, I had uh, a camera system that took the sequential, it's, it was like the old uh, Golf Digest sequence photos um, that I would stand on the, the tee. It was kind of like that Kodak thing. You'd, you'd come off with approximately, I think it was nine frames uh, that you could show, uh, and I, I would do that. Um, and I'd you know draw lines on there and all of that kind of thing. But uh, before that, it was simply I would take the club and get up and demonstrate to them, this is what I see you doing. This is where I want you to get to. Uh, and then get in there and kind of put hands on, put them in the position I wanted them to get into. And it was all all really about, uh, uh, you know, taking them through drills and, and position drills, things like that. So were there... Um were there physical things that you would do too, like uh, or physical objects, like maybe a noodle or things like that, where you would say, "Okay, swing back to here," and then they would be able to feel that when they when they hit it, or or things of that nature. Sure. Um, well, I'd, yeah, I go back far enough back that there weren't even noodles back then. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I I would take a a, a, a cut off shaft. Right. Uh, put a shaft in the ground to, to give them a sense of, of staying on the inside of uh, the, the ball. I would do, <laughs> I'd use shoe boxes. I'd use all kinds of things to try to get them to, uh, you know, complete a motion, um, trying to change path or something like that. If you give them something to avoid, um, they can, they can typically, typically uh, do that. 
I'd use back then, I would, I'd use a magic marker, set a, put a line on the ball, not for alignment or anything, but to give them a, a, a visual uh, representation of the direction of the swing that I wanted them to make. Uh, but yeah, we had to, we had to do a lot more uh, improvising uh, back then. Sure, absolutely. Um, because, because if that technology isn't there now, now as for technology now, what's the technology that you're utilizing um, on a daily basis? Well, I, 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 you know, I take my at my iPad every everywhere I go. Uh, when I go down to the lesson T, I uh, use V1 uh, as the app uh, with it, um, and then um, we I'd also use a, a launch monitor uh, for. Uh, um, I never really thought I would use it for teaching, but I do now. Um, but um, uh, just a, the kind of the combination of those those things. Um, also use uh, some um, uh, kinesthetic swing aids, like I'll I'll use a uh, um, the a, a plane trainer, um, you know, a swing ring uh, kind of thing, where uh, someone can kind of get a sense of. Uh, what path and plane, how those two things uh, come together, what that feels like to keep the club on on plane and on the proper path. Um, and and I'll, I'll use uh, I use Medicus, uh, I'll use uh, alignment sticks a lot, uh, things like that. Are you using um, the launch monitor to for them to see path also and and to kind of for you to say uh, to them it, it is is the past starting to change and and, and yes yep yeah but and and most of the teaching i do here bernard is is outdoors i get you know we have pretty good weather uh just about year round um my sense was that within our performance center here i would use it uh, i would use that launch monitor more for indoor training uh and then uh for club fitting uh, but I, I incorporate it, especially with some of our better uh, players. I'll, I'll incorporate it into my teaching. Yeah, I know for us, we use, um, we definitely use it, and uh, we're not using it in every lesson. Yeah. But but we are using it um, as sometimes as references for players to see where they were before, and then we might go back to it later, and and have them hit a few balls on it. And see where they are in improvement in their path and in their and in their impact and and where their face is and where their swing bottom is and mm -hmm. and yep. things of that nature. Yeah. So, are you working on swing bottom a lot with most of your students? Also, is that a mainstay that is pretty much uh, in a lot of lessons, or is it more about shaping shots, ball flight, things of that nature? Well, that, that a lot of it works around ball flight uh, because I really, I, I really kind of work backwards. You know, it's where's where's the ball going? What is it doing? Uh, that comes back to what is the club doing to produce that, and then the humans hooked to the other end of that club. So, what are they doing to create those impact conditions? Um, and and for a number, uh, yeah, being able to relate what that that swing bottom looks like. You know whether. Uh, some people, it, you're, I'm needing to make them be a little steeper to get more on top of it. Some I'm needing to shallow out to, to kind of get uh, uh, the uh, the impact point to uh, be correct. Uh, so it really depends on the individual. But I, I really do work around um, ball flight a lot. What's the ball doing? That'll tell me what I need to do with you. Right. So how how do you help them? change their ball flight do you adjust plane do you adjust um what they're doing in relationship to the ground um maybe ground force type things mm -hmm. um wh what do you find uh you use the most and and what do you find is for the majority of your students the easiest way to translate the change that ball flight yeah well i i, I really kind of try to stay within uh, the context of, of of three things um, you know, what is the, what is the face position relative to path and what is the angle of approach look like? Um, that, that those, those things contribute the most to, uh, the shots that, that you hit. And then I, I really look at, at, at the golfer from a standpoint of when I go back to ball flight, most of the things that they do in the golf swing are based around the, uh, the, the kind of results they're being getting with the ball flight. 
you know, and if it's if it's somebody who's having trouble getting it in the air, they tend to change the bottom of that swing to kind of try to slide under it and add loft and, and so forth. If it's someone who has uh, a directional uh, problem, they tend to uh, adapt the uh, the swing path to uh, uh, to that directional problem. I'll say, you know, if, if someone who's really shallow from in to out uh, with a big hook, it's kind of the chicken or the egg. I'm, my guess is that the hook started to happen, which got them trying to start it further to the right to make room for the hook, and then all of those things contribute to create more hook. So uh, if I can kind of get the the ball flight to change, if you're if it's a hook or a slice, if I can make the uh, ball fly straight first, uh, then I can move on to trying to get them to aim it in the direction that they want it to go. If their start line is uh, uh, is on target and the ball stays on that line, then I'll move on to the to the angle part of it. So I know that I found that you know it's funny. I just had a student recently and. Um... He had a tendency to hit a cut, um, mm. a, fair, a fairly uh, big, big cut. Um, not, I wouldn't really consider it a slice, but, but it was, you know, it, it, it was a nice fade. Uh, but what he would do is he would start to set up left. Um, he would actually set up in the center of the tee box um, yeah. instead of picking one side or the other. Right. Yeah. Right. So he's and, cutting his odds in half already. Exactly. And then, and then he would start to aim down the left side, um, and and his actually his shoulders would begin to open up, and 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 his stance was um, a little bit open in relationship to where he wanted to hit the ball, and he felt that, and then and then he would hit an even bigger cut, um, and right. then I would say to him, you know. Why, why are you setting up so that everything is aiming left? I mean, do you realize that you're aligned left? And he goes, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to aim left because I know I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna hit it to the right. And, and then really what happened was it produced an even bigger result than, <laughs> right. than what he wanted. He actually cut it even more. Right. So once we started to adjust his stance and his setup and his, especially like for him, his open shoulders, um, get his shoulders a little bit closed mm -hmm. uh, to the target. Uh, not really closed, but more aiming square to the target. Right. Or what it, felt to closed. him it felt closed. Yeah. Uh, then all of a sudden, he would hit a soft cut and not, and not a big cut um, or, or almost a slice. Uh, occasionally, he would, he would hit some pulls. Um, but that, I believe, is you know, it's a normal process in, in changing things over. Uh, now, do you find that a lot of players have a tendency to do these things? I, I'm finding that um, the more that I, I work with players, and these are players that are that are really pretty decent players. I mean, they're not they're not like 25, 30 handicappers. They're, I mean, this gentleman was an eight, um, yeah. Yeah. And, but but he just hit this, you know, and and then when we were finished, uh. You know, he was hitting balls much, much more solid. I mean, we did a two-day program with him, and and and. But I think that his biggest problem was was really that alignment. And and do you find that a lot of players? I mean, they, they it's really their alignment that's causing a lot of their issues. They really have a pretty decent swing, but because they're never aimed at their target, they're never hitting it to their target. Yeah, yeah, I, I do. I find that uh, quite a bit, and and it's it's from the. Uh, the the newer golfer all the way to the pretty skilled golfer as you just said um, and and I'll just say that it what it sets up is there are um, there are behaviors that golfers uh, their physical behaviors that golfers it, it might start almost you know subconsciously that are around past ball flight if if that ball's moving from left to right the instinct is to begin to aim it further left to make room for it without the realization that the more you do that, the more you compound it. And, uh, uh, and also, yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll find fixing, fixing alignment, uh, and, and taking away the, the thing that made the behavior begin, which was that sideways movement of the ball. Uh, if you can, if you can get it to fly in a straight line, it becomes easier to aim and align it. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you know, and I've, I've also found, too, that when players are, are misaligned and they don't realize that they are, 
and then they look at their target. They, their, their body tries to steer the ball to that target, and it actually ends up causing more, more issues or more harm than good. Um, as opposed to if they were lying to their target and then they looked at their target, they would let it go to their target. Yeah. Yeah, I had, um, uh, in fact, I, I got to work with uh, a woman Olympic um, medalist that was um, a, um, you know, a, a skeet shooter. Um, and as, as we were talking about defining the difference between aim, which is what you do with the club face, and alignment, which is what you do with the body, she had like this epiphany, and, and she gave me a great quote. She said, it would be like you coming to me to learn how to shoot a gun. And if, you know, if, if it was a, uh, uh, um, a handgun, you know, you would, you would put the, the gun up, sight down the line, and you'd look right down the line that you were shooting down. She said, you know, imagine if you came to me to learn this, and I said, yeah, you not start here. You need to move over here, aim the gun over there, and stand over on this line and figure out that alignment. Um, and th that's that's it. They're, they're, your, your perception of what aiming and aligning is, is the tendency is to aim the body and then set the club down behind the ball versus aim the club and then align the body with that. Absolutely. I mean, and I, I try to let a lot of my students understand that. And I also try to have them, you know, choose that near field target and, and pick their line from behind the ball. Right. Um, for the fact that the way that we see as humans, um, our eyes are level to the horizon line when we're trying yeah. to find something square. Yeah. And if we are looking sideways to that, our eyes are no longer level to the horizon line. We get an skewed version, right? And then, and then we aim to that, and it's really we're really not aiming at our target. Yeah. I a lot of times use that gun theory with my students and say, "Would you look down the barrel of the gun, or would you hold the gun to the side like this, like you kind of are looking at at your target now?" Right. It's really not going to work. You might hit your target once in a while, but yeah. the odds of you. Um, you know, and I, I always attribute it to, I, I'll say to them, if we were at war and, and the enemy was over there and you were holding your gun like this and I was holding my gun looking down the barrel, who would kill more of the enemy? And they yeah. would immediately say, well, you would, of course, unless you were a terrible shot. Right. <laughs> and I said, yeah. So I said, let's try to look down the barrel a little bit um, and, and get your alignment. I think that there's so many, I think that alignment plays such a huge issue and I think that so many people just kind of forgo that. They don't, and then they wonder why they're not. And again, as we get back to fundamentals, those are fundamentals. And if they're not right. sound, then how can we, it doesn't matter whether we swing like Dustin Johnson, if he's not aligned correctly, yeah. he's, yeah. Not, he's not hitting his target. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's crazy and, and I, that, that people um, kind of don't uh, pay attention to that. Well, I, I, you know, again, I think I think it goes back to um, the way teaching is done now. Uh, what is relied upon um, uh, with everything that, that that you know, with the technological advances that that we have, that sometimes we tend to drift away from what the fundamentals are, and those are always the basis. I mean, the fundamentals have not changed. Uh, so uh, it's it's uh, we we tend to look for um, answers uh, in other places than starting with what the, the foundation, those fundamentals should be. Yeah, I, I believe too that even with technology that, um, that nothing has ever changed um, from 40 years ago. It's just oh, our yeah. perception of what it was and now how we're having a different perception of what it is due to that technology. True. And as they improve that technology, because that technology is still evolving, um, mm, sure. Then, then it we might have, let's say, in another ten, fifteen years from now, have a little bit even different take on on what we're seeing and and understanding uh, from today. Yeah, yeah, and I think, um, and, and and in talking about the you know teaching and and and, and coaching. Um, uh, it, 
our our industry has has undergone uh, some tremendous change in in that uh, aspect as well. And I, I think we need to look at ourselves more as 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 coaches. What uh, um, you know, what helping a golfer develop encompasses uh, is a lot more than pointing out a flaw uh, in their uh, in their golf swing. Um, you know, I, I do a lot of work um, uh, through um, our company IMAP uh, with looking at what goes on between the ears and kind of in the uh, the internal part of of the golfer. Um, you know what what drives some of those uh, uh, emotions and reactions um, uh, when we play, and really kind of getting into the the understanding of the person that's a standing in front of you, uh, and and giving them the tools that they need to be able to uh, learn better and then manage themselves better as they play. So, do you have a type of test that you put them through um, to understand that? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I always uh, caution in, in, in using the, the, the word test because that sounds like there could be a pass or fail. Right. But, um, but we use... Uh, an evaluation. An evaluation, exactly. Um, yes, we have a, an assessment tool that we use. It was really developed, uh, Bernard, for the uh, kind of the corporate um, market. Um, you know, companies are always trying to put... Uh, people in, in uh, positions to succeed uh, and use um, a, a, some, some sort of an assessment tool uh, to do that. Um, uh, I was uh, lucky enough to, uh, uh, to meet uh, Connie Charles uh, about 25 years ago and uh, we started to develop from the Berkman uh, a, um, a, a golf assessment. And it really kind of looks at the things that, that drive a person's behaviors. Um, well, first thing we look at is what are you interested in? What are the things that uh, about the game uh, that will help fuel your passion? And that's it's uh, uh, it's it's different for every individual. Mm. So we look for interest first. Uh, what style uh, of play? How you conduct yourself? How others might describe you as you play when you're being successful? To identify those strengths, um, then the kind of support you need in your environment uh, for you to be successful. And then if, if those things aren't available to you, how you will, how it uh, kind of manifests itself in stress reactive behavior, uh, and then how to manage yourself through, through that. Uh, so it really kind of looks at four dimensions of what, uh, uh, what makes you as a person unique. Um, and then you bring those characteristics to the game of golf. So how, how do you think those those rules apply to beginner, intermediate, and advanced players, and where do you think those rules would be best served for most players in well, that category? I, I, yeah, I, I think it uh, for beginners, um, part of what we try to do is um, give them a real clear understanding of self. Uh, because those those same characteristics of your personality, uh, whether you're new to golf or not, are the same strengths that you need to bring to bear against the game as you um, begin to learn it. And uh, we do things like uh, we have a coaching report that is part of our IMAP survey. And that tells a coach what are the things that are going to be important for you to be able to connect with this person. Uh, keep them motivated through that that time of struggle that they'll go through as they improve their skills or develop their skills. Uh, and for the for the player themselves, it kind of really uh, gives them a roadmap of uh, what this might do. You know how you might react as you go through the process of uh, developing your skills, so you can then really take advantage of your strengths. For better players, uh, it's usually the first time that they've really turned that lens inward uh, to themselves. They, um, you know, typically they have coaches and they have people outside them telling them what to do, showing them what they're doing and all. Uh, for this to be able to kind of turn that lens inward and show what are the unique characteristics that make you successful, and then how do those compare with uh, when you when you're playing? I always. I say that if you if you look at the tour these days and and it's really starting to come out again, uh, it's kind of a, a flashback to the old days. You're really starting to see 
personalities again. You're really starting to see people being themselves and that's part of what we stress is you should be yourself. You should just be your best self. And, uh, and giving them the tools to do that, giving them a context in which to look at themselves and, and, and see that their actions and reactions are unique to them. Don't compare yourself to somebody else. Be the best you can be. Um, so it really kind of works uh, up and down the, uh, uh, the chain between a beginner and a, and a, a seasoned professional. And that definitely uh, transfers into life, too, because, uh, you know, no matter what you're doing in life, you need to do the best that you can be, not the best that someone else can be. Um, you, you have unique attributes that other people do not possess. They may parallel some of the things that other people have. But um, I, I've always said that to my kids, you know, embrace you. I mean, it's you're right. a unique individual and uh, you should be glad that you're blessed to be who you are and uh, and to take advantage of all those things and use them to their full greatest potential uh, and as players I think that that's again very important and it goes kind of back hand in hand with life and golf and I think that that's why most of us love this game so much is because there's always those parallels right right I mean it, it the game does it uh, and and regardless of your personality characteristics, the game has something for everybody. I mean, it really does. Uh, it it's um, it, if you can approach it from that standpoint that you own your own game, um, the the rewards are uh, are tremendous. Um, and you know, we, we really came at this, but in a in in kind of a we we backed into it for the golfer. Um, uh, we started doing uh, programs for um, corporate executives, you know, Fortune 500 companies. Sure. Um, started working with a, um, a kind of a boutique consulting firm who was looking for a differentiator uh, for them. And, and what they noticed was there were a lot of executives that also played golf. So creating this uh, ability to get a, um, a kind of a – um, an assessment tool that looked at what are the characteristics that make you unique, uh, bring you, that you can bring strengths to whatever it is you're doing in your work world. Well, getting getting uh, executives to do an assessment, uh, just like, just like golfers, it's a f funny story. Um, if they're taking an assessment tool, they're trying to guess what it is that the outcome is going to be viewed as if if they're applying for a sales job they try to manipulate the answers in that uh, uh, in that assessment to make them look like I'm going to be a great salesman or uh, or if it's if or if it's a, an accounting uh, position or a, a, a financial position they're looking for the things that will make them come out looking like I'd be a great financial person um, when they when we told them that if you answered this questionnaire, uh, um, uh, you know, um, honestly, this could help your golf game. The outcome was that, uh, and companies clicked onto this right away, that they would be more honest in their answers if they thought it was going to help their golf game than they would if they <laughs> thought it was going to have something to do with their career path. Um, and, uh, and, and, and using that, that evaluation, uh, in that way, we started to do team building, uh, programs for companies based on the true self. Yeah. Which I'm sure it, it not only helps their game, it probably helps other things in their lives too. Absolutely. I mean, whenever, whenever you can, and, uh, embrace your own self or your own uniqueness, um, I mean, we feel the most comf comfortable in our own skin. Um, right. So when we're trying to be something that we're not, it's definitely going to have a factor that's going to impede what our natural things are that, that we normally do. Um, right. If we can relax and just be ourselves, then we're probably going to perform much better due to that fact. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that's just uh, having a way to, to really identify what, what are the elements that provide that for you. I mean, what are the conditions under which your strengths can come out? 
Now, how do you support that once you get them through that program? Um, do they have uh, certain things that they need to use as triggers or, or things that, that bring them back to, to staying within themselves and not kind of chasing away from that? Mm-hmm. Well, I, I, yes, they, they do. We, um, um, there, the IMAP, um, report that comes back really gives them a, um, a, a workbook, if you were, um, and depending on the context, uh, if you're going to learn the game, you, your, your graph gives you hints and helpful tips on how to find an instructor that will mesh with you. Um, or for an instructor to be able to understand how they need to modify uh, their approach um, uh, to, uh, to better uh, teach you, then it gives a lot of helpful ten- hints in there about uh, how to manage themselves through the learning process, how to take it onto the golf course. That's, that's one of those other uh, you know, mystical things about the game where you can really you can get things going on the range and then somewhere between there and the 150 yards between the tee and the first tee, everything disappears. Uh, really understanding what is going on when you sh- when you change um, environments, what it does to you. Um, uh, hence that during play, uh, because you know once you once you hit that first tee shot, everything is uh, uh, is not in your control anymore. There are going to be certain things that would uh, uh, create triggers for stress for you. And then we give them what we call mental mulligans, things that you can do within the context of a game when you feel those pressure uh, switches being um, uh, triggered um, for you to do to get and keep yourself in control. Uh, So yes, it's uh, uh, quite extensive kind of from you at your best to you at your worst and what to do in between. It's very interesting. And uh, so if, if, our listeners want to get in touch with you uh, to maybe to maybe do this evaluation, mm-hmm. um, and and how can they do that? And can they do an evaluation like that with you? And then maybe if they're across the country and not able to work with you later, but still get that information. Absolutely, yeah. It, you just uh, the listeners can go to imapgolf.com. Uh, that is uh, that's where you'll kind of see. Um, uh, what the uh, what the assessment tool is all about? What some sample reports kind of get an idea of what uh, how the reports look and what they provide, um, and uh, and then they can do interactive coaching through me. They can come right to to me, uh, kind of in this uh, context as you and I are talking. Mm-hmm. Um, and we also work with um, a lot of uh, professionals, uh, golf professionals, who uh, we certify. Uh, in uh, this assessment uh, tool, uh, and they can go right to their professional. Yeah, I, w- I would be very interested in that. Um, so, so if you could send something that uh, on the lines along to me, I would. Uh, that would be fantastic. Sure. And, yeah, and then I'll, we I'll can also you, put that also, on the on the yeah. site, so that if other professionals are interested, they can contact you, and and get involved with that. Great. Great. Yeah, and I'll send you examples of what the coaching report looks like, and uh, um, and also the, the we do uh, we still do a lot of um, corporate um, uh, golf. Mm-hmm. Uh, Connie and I just came out with a book that is called Back on Course, uh, and it's really all about this connection between um, the, the corporate world and and golf. It's it's why it makes such a great partnership, and and. Uh, and how business people can take advantage of the game. Awesome. So where, where can our listeners find that book? That's also at uh, imapgolf.com. Uh, that is, uh, is right there. It, it's uh, published uh, through Amazon, uh, and uh, they, can, uh, they can certainly order a book uh, through the website. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, well Dave, uh, thanks you so much for being with us. I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to discuss these things with our listeners. And um, hopefully, uh, I wish you, of course, great success, continued success in all your endeavors. And thanks again for, for being with us. Well, Bernard, thank you. It's been a pleasure being on. And uh, you've got that open invitation anytime you're in Sedona.
Come and see me. I would love to do that. So eventually, you know, I'm, I'm definitely, I would like to get out there. There's a lot of other, other other places too out there that I haven't been out there for. When you started is when I was out there last. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, 40 years yeah, it's ago. Changed. It's, it's changed quite a bit. Yeah. That's, that's how long it's been since I've been like in, uh, in the, you know, in, in Arizona. I yeah. was uh, just about 19 years old. I was this is the age of my son when I went out there, and yeah. uh, and it was a whole different world compared to the East Coast. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a dry it's a dry heat. Remember that. Yeah. Oh no, I know. Yeah, it <laughs> is. Yeah, yeah, it's hot, but it is a dry heat, so it, it doesn't feel quite the same as it would out here. Right. All right. Well, until we meet again, do your best to keep it in the short grass, and thanks again. Are you tired of hitting poor shots and shooting high scores? Wouldn't it be nice to make solid, consistent contact more often? Hit more fairways off the tee and more greens with your approach shots. Lower your three putts per round and shoot lower scores consistently. Lessons with Bernard Sheridan at Impact Zone Golf at Tiburon Golf Club in Naples is the fastest way to lower your scores and start making the game fun again. Call 239-236-5536 and schedule your lesson today. Remember, if you improve your impact, you improve your game. It's that simple.